Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So, Colin, this week we've got part two in our two-part series on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and our discussion with the Air Minded Podcast, Lieutenant Colonel Tyson Gorilla Wetzel. So, in the first part of this series, we introduced his podcast and his really amazing discussion that he had with Dr. Kelly Grieco on lessons that we can learn from the Russia-Ukraine war and how that applies to air power. Brilliant, fantastic discussion. And so we wanted to leave that with you in its entirety for that first part of this series. And so today, Colin, you and I are going to talk not only about that interview, but also about the interview that I had with Colonel Wetzel after. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. What are some of kind of your you know, big takeaways, things that cue the audience before we turn it over to Grill and I for the interview. I thought that the interview with Dr. Kelly Grieco is a great primer for everything that's going to come next. I really enjoyed the discussion that they had in terms of lessons learned, or even better, not learning the wrong lessons, right? And that's going to come up again in this interview, and as well as our commentary hereafter. But I want people to pay attention to that. Perfect. If you haven't yet listened to part one, please go do that. It will be very beneficial for you as an Air Force officer, as someone who is an American citizen, maybe considering joining the Air Force. It will help you better understand the discussion that's going to take place here in a, in a moment with Gorilla, which, by the way, I want that call sign. Can I covet a call sign? Uh, is that allowed? You can covet them, but you can't like have it that's <laughs> i'm sure there's like blood sport involved if you really want it or something but uh, i'm just a little bit jealous i must <laughs> say anyway great interview um both the one from last week and this one coming up some really important lessons learned that i'm excited to discuss with you and i'm really grateful for the time that you spent that gorilla was willing to come on the show and share his thoughts with us yeah agreed he's a busy guy you know graduated commander doing his sde Really enjoyed the interview. And with that, we'll turn it over to Gorilla and myself for the interview. We'll catch you on the backside. All right. Welcome back to the Commission Ed Podcast. I'm Reed Gann. Today, I am joined by Lieutenant Colonel Tyson Gorilla Wetzel. Sir, really excited to have you on the podcast today. Reed, thanks for having me. Love what you guys do. And uh, you said you were going to, one sir, that's it. No more for the rest of the night. Yep, that's it. I said I, said I would get it in there. So, Gorilla, Really excited to have you on. This is the second episode. Last time we published your interview with Dr. Kelly Grieco, where you explored, you know, what at the time was about the four-week perspective on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and especially focus on the air war. And Colin and I were just enthralled with that episode. We thought it was fascinating because it's something that both he and I have really kind of come to grips with a little bit it feels like things are changing. The Air Force we grew up in, the nature of conflict, the fact that, I mean, we were born with air supremacy, right? We never really had to think about it. I did a little bit in my first assignment as an intel officer. I was out in, in Hawaii at the AOC. So our enemies, adversaries had air forces and had ADISs and had, you know, airspace and things like that. But that's not where I went to war. I went to the Kayak where we could fly wherever we yeah, wanted. We exactly. And so it's in that light that we really want to think about, well, what does this mean for us as officers? How is this changing? What is this changing for the U.S. Air Force? And really want to pick your brain on that. So, well, Grilla, welcome again. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, what you're doing now, and kind of how you where you got to and kind of how that frames your perspective on what we're talking about today. All right. Tyson Wetzel, go by Gorilla. Last episode, you guys got into call signs. I had a previous call sign getter. 
there were some times when the fighter pilot culture was maybe not uh, cleanest and I had to be renamed. So some uh, of your listeners may know me by my previous call sign. But anyways, I've been in for just shy of 20 years. I'm an intelligence officer by trade. My path to the Air Force was certainly not a, uh, a straight line. I graduated college from a small school, small liberal arts school in Southern California called the University of Redlands. I graduated in 2000 and was just kind of listless. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I hated what I was doing. And then September 11th happened, and I knew that I wanted to do more. I never thought the military was for me. I didn't feel like a particular rule follower. I didn't know how to make my bed or put my socks away or, or any of the things that I anticipated you would need to do at officer training school or basic military training. So I, I had never thought about going into the military, but I was kind of having this feeling of like, man, I'm not doing anything with my life. And in uh, early 02, I went to my best friend's pilot training graduation, this guy, Mike Hostelinch, he's now an F-35 pilot down at Eglin. And something about being at uh, Laughlin Air Force Base for that pilot training graduation, I don't know what it was. It was like, this is what I want to do. I have horrible eyes. I'm 2400. I knew I would never fly an airplane, but I was like, I'm... I want to get as close to an airplane as I can. I'm going to do this for four years. The Air Force can use me for four years. I'm going to use them and go get a master's degree four years and done. Here I am 20 years later in terms of what I've done in my career. The first about 10 years or so supporting fighters, I supported F-15s, F-16s, F-22s, went to weapons school and was an instructor there. I did my uh, DO or director of operations in Hawaii in the DGS Distributed Ground Station 5 which uh, exploits spy planes, if you will, MQ-9, U-2, RQ-4. And then I did some joint staff time. I did school at Marine Corps Command and Staff. And then I I was lucky enough. You guys talk about leadership and command a lot. I was lucky enough to just finish up two years in command here at uh, Fort Meade, where I commanded the 32nd Intelligence Squadron, the absolute honor of my career. And then uh, I got a real tough deal after that, my, uh, my senior developmental education is working at a think tank here in D.C., the Atlantic Council. So uh, for a year, I'm not wearing a uniform and I'm taking the train in and I work at a think tank where I do a lot of thinking and writing. It's been pretty fantastic. And then in my spare time, I host a podcast as well called the Air Minded Podcast, really focused on air power history, at least it was until the Ukraine air war. As you replayed uh, my episode with Dr. Kelly Greco, really since the war has kicked off, done a lot of focusing on the Ukraine air war. So long answer. Hopefully I wasn't the longest to ever answer that question that way. No, it was perfect. We've got a ton of overlaps. So I'm guessing you commissioned at OTS. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember the student squadron you were in by chance? The Hoyas? Okay. You were a Hoya. I was a tiger. Not everybody could be a tiger, but that's okay. Not your fault. (laughs) I can't believe believe that I came up with that. That, that, Somehow that penguin is still on the iceberg. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's a monumental life-changing experience, I'm sure. I was the worst officer trainee. I was horrible at OTS. I didn't know how to put on a uniform. It was during the old BDU days. I did not know how to shine boots. I was a wreck. I lived across the hall from a master sergeant who was so frustrated with me and worked so hard to get me through OTS, probably thinking like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm putting this dude out into the service. (laughs) Uh, I'd like to think I got to be a better officer than I was at uh, OTS. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we'll talk offline. We've got other overlaps, I'm sure, our time in Hawaii even. And then I was at Fort Meade the same time you were. No, that's perfect. I appreciate it. How do we adjust? Let's start there. What are we learning now that we can apply to what it means to be an Air Force officer and where do we go from here? Well, so first off, great and big question to start. I actually go back to the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which said that we need to foster a competition mindset. We're about to get the 22 version of uh, the NDS. But to me, that was a very simplified and very easy to understand way of saying that we need to change our whole mindset for how we fight wars We've done great work in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least at the tactical level. There's maybe some strategic mistakes, and we could talk about that in a whole other podcast. But we need to change our mindset from a world where we have had air supremacy to something where we are going to be, we are going to have contested skies. And I don't want to take my own thunder away here when I talk about what it means to be an officer. I will simply say that I think the profession of arms is very important. And I consider myself a professional in that business. And as such, you have to learn and you have to study. So I am looking every day at what's going on in the air war over Ukraine to determine what is happening. Is the character of war changing 
So for anybody that listened to episode one of this, Dr. Greco, who is brilliant, she thinks that the character of the air war is changing and the way that we conceptualize air superiority is changing and going to be more difficult. Well, that should be a very clear call to Air Force officers that we need to up our game because we're going to be in a contested world going forward. That's going to be the rest of our careers. If that's the case, we better be really good at it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, the signs were there. General Brown published Accelerate, Change, or Lose almost immediately upon it, you know, coming into the seat. At the same time, I'm not sure how much that's resonated. It's almost like we can't comprehend that that's what it could be like. I mean, you and I, we've been in this game, you know, decade plus at this point, and we've never confronted the kinds of things that are described in that document. Why is it that it's hard to connect with that, do you think? Is it just our shared experience is so different? I think so. I, I think that's a major part. I think shared experience is a great way to talk about it. Most of us, aside from like the general officers, virtually everybody, our age and below, everybody, signed up in a time of war. And that war was a war first off of vengeance against Al-Qaeda and, and those that protected them, and then kind of expanded. But that was the war that we were used to. And we started to get used to counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, which was very different. Like the generation before us had Desert Storm, had Allied Force, had contested skies. And that generation had to change significantly, kind of on a dime on September 11th. They had to figure out how are we going to fight this war in the hills of Afghanistan. Well, who knows? And they kind of rewrote the book that we had thrown away in Vietnam. Well, I think we're starting, that pendulum is about to swing or has already swung. And I think we're starting to see the first indications of it in the current air war. So everything that we have known for our entire careers is how to fight that war. And it is tough to change, especially when that conflict is not really over. The people who dislike us and the organizations that dislike everything that we represent, they have not gone away. And so we still have to fight that, but we, at least our civilian leaders have told us that the existential threat to America right now, the thing we need to be concerned with is great power or now called strategic competition. It's tough to make that change. And when you are talking about a multi-million person bureaucracy like the United States military, it doesn't move on a dime. It moves like the Titanic. General Brown, he does not accept that that is how it will always be. And that to him was accelerate, change or lose. I've heard him talk about it, which is, terrible job of paraphrasing General Brown, but he was not going to wait until, you know, take 90 days and listen or whatever. He wanted to come in and on the first day be talking accelerate, change or lose because he figured he had four years, you know, to the day to get something done and he couldn't do business as usual and he got to respect it. He's going to try to move this behemoth during his time in office. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You talk about how we have to up our game. We have to learn. We have to study. I remember for IDE and correspondence finding some of his writings from years ago where he's talking about agile combat employment, you know, a C-17 landing on some remote airstrip, a couple fighters land, they get fueled, they get fixed, they get armed and they take off again from this austere base. And at the time, I remember thinking, that's crazy. Like, there's no way that's going to happen. Yet he had that vision well before he was chief of staff. I will take you even further back. About a month after I put on captain, I went to my first assignment as a weapons officer to Kunsan Air Base in Korea. And the wing commander, uh, who's known as the Wolf, was then Colonel CQ Brown. So I got uh, about six months of working with him. I, I later worked with him on a deployment again, worked for him on a deployment. It was so clear just as a wing commander that he was a big thinker that it wasn't just, I'm going to take care of my wing, which is important. And he definitely did. It was he was already thinking about fighting tonight and how we would fight on the peninsula. And you could just tell that as a leader, he was going places. And buddies of mine who we loved working for him were like, he's going to be Comac or CSAF someday. And I got to tell you, I'm not surprised at all. And he's the kind of guy, if you ever are lucky enough to work for him, you'd absolutely run through a wall for him. He is that kind of an inspirational leader. And so I am hook, line, and sinker on accelerate, change, or lose, because I know what he's trying to do, and it's not a buzz phrase for him. He, I think, and I've heard him say in speeches that he wants to leave the service better than what he found it. You know, and at the end of his four years, he wants us to be better uh, ready to fight China or Russia. We hope that we don't, but a big way of making sure that we don't is having the force to credibly deter either or both of those countries. Yeah. 
No, that's really awesome. I love how you brought up that history with him. And, you know, thinking back to your history, right? You grew up in the fighter community, Intel support to, you know, fighter squadrons, gone to weapon school, then you were an instructor there. So Colin and I have talked about this a lot. And, you know, even when we were back, when he was at ROTC and I was at OTS and we taught these lessons, so much of our identity as a service is tied up in the beautiful gray aircraft that we get to, you know, employ. Our identity, you know, you look at the different pilots, they associate themselves with their airframes. Their entire communities and cultures built up around that. We explored that in our fighter pilot episode, fighter pilot culture. How do we adjust that concept? And, and I know General Brown talks about it again in that paper. The focus on aircraft and on capabilities and on technology, also, you know, core parts of our identity to focusing on the knowledge, skill, and ability of the people, because that's the key that's going to make these changes, right? It's the people that are going to use equipment in a new way or, you know, exploit this littoral airspace that you and Dr. Greco explored, which was a fascinating idea. I'm sure we could talk about that for hours. How do we make that shift? And are you seeing those things happening? So I have about three minds on this. So first off, I think for the young company grade officers that would be listening, they don't need to devise on a bar napkin how to beat China in the squadron heritage room. They should be thinking about becoming tactical experts. But one thing that I would encourage some of our younger officers to realize that I certainly didn't as a young officer was that they play a role, they are a cog in the machine of a much bigger organization that does have to think about that. And as you grow in your career, you will have a greater scope of responsibility and you'll start to understand a little bit more of what is going on. So that being said, this is the kind of second part of my mind is even at that younger, you know, as a lieutenant or captain, I don't think you can just say, I'm only going to be focused on being a tactical expert. I think that's your top job. But kind of second or, or somewhere down the line, you've got to be thinking about learning a little bit more about this world, learning a little bit more about the profession that we are in so that you are building some of those kind of the building blocks to get better and to be ready for the moment as your scope uh, increases. So I think that, you know, a little bit of reading about China, what makes them tick, you know, read AI superpowers, you know, it's a, it's a good one or the hundred year war, something like that read any of the books on Vladimir Putin and why he is the way he is, just to start understanding a little bit. So foster that competitive mindset, figure out how you can be better for your squadron, for your unit, for your fighting force, as the people who have the greater scope of responsibility come up with that. The third thing, and just give me a minute here, I've talked about it on my podcast, there is an era of Air Force history that I absolutely love to study. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm seeing a lot of parallels. The Air Force came out of Vietnam very frustrated for a lot of reasons. Micromanagement at the highest levels of government, pretty poor tactical execution. But in particular, a lot of the combat air crews that were coming back were really angry that they felt that they were underprepared for conflict. And they thought they left uh, some good people out there in Southeast Asia because they weren't trained up. And they came back and it was a group of super pissed off captains and majors that fundamentally rechanged or changed the Air Force. And it wasn't just equipment. Yeah, there was new equipment. There was F-117s that were coming, the F-15, the AIM-120 missile that would go on that. There was a lot of new equipment in the late 70s, early 80s. But I think the reason that we crushed it in Desert Storm was not so much the equipment. That was important. But as we've seen from Russia, great equipment only gets you so far. What also happened during that era of post-Vietnam, pre-Desert Storm, was a complete change in the way that we thought about fighting the air war, how we thought about air superiority. We developed new doctrine, new tactics, new training, realistic training, in particular out at Nellis. And the service as a whole got better, and they were ready come 1991. So there was a fundamental shift after somewhat frustrating combat performance in a conflict. I'm seeing the same thing. We are coming out of two decades of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations where I feel like air power has not been employed optimally. And a big part of that is because we have sort of just provided air power on demand to the battle space owner, that commander on the ground that wants their MQ-1 or MQ-9 to look over the next hill. Don't even, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> oh, man. But... Air power experts know how to strategically employ air power. So I think you got a lot of people my age, your age, who are like, ah, we can do this better. Well, 
Now we need to rise to the challenge of a different force, one that is going to challenge us potentially, we hope not in a shooting war. So I like to think of the parallels in that late 70s era to what we're going through right now. And I hope that when we look back, you know, our successors and our respective podcasts look back and 20 years and say, yeah, it was that generation was really doing some thinking and they learned how to employ the penetrating counter air or the B-21 or whatever. And because of that, either we deterred conflict or we were really successful in Operation Taiwanese Freedom. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Kind of the take homes that the big themes that you're seeing in the Russia, Ukraine and kind of the implications. We're at what, week eight now? Yeah, it started on the uh, 23rd, yeah. Yeah, so we're about week eight. So let's take the opportunity now with what we were just kind of talking about to put the lens of the current conflict that we're observing. So Russia, Ukraine, you and Dr. Grigo broke it down really well, but that was kind of, you know, the first four weeks or so. Things have progressed. We're about week eight as we record this today, you know, near the end of April. What are some of maybe your top three or the biggest things that you're seeing that we need to be listening to and paying attention to? As you said, we need to up our game. We need to study. We need to look back in history. What are the contexts? What are the things that we kind of need to be paying attention to? So I'm, I'm really concerned that we're taking the wrong lessons out of the Ukraine air war. So the number one lesson that everybody is taking is that the Russians suck. Yeah, they've made some serious mistakes. And I think the mistakes start all the way at the top. They made some strategic errors in terms of thinking that this was going to just be a run over, that they were going to land the knockout blow in three to five days. And they didn't plan effectively. And that leads to my my number one overarching thing that that Russia failed to do. So I I take the two sides of what Russia's failing to do. I want to learn from. So first and foremost, their operational plan was terrible. And in particular, and and I talked about this on one of my podcasts, is they wasted their night one. So your night one of the conflict is the best chance that you have to just reap devastation on the adversary. They didn't have a very good plan. They struck too many locations. They didn't concentrate fires. They didn't use their non-kinetic fires, which, come on, we're 21st century war. They really needed to. And they did not knock out the Ukrainian Air Force. And they're still suffering the consequences of it. Eight weeks later, they haven't established air superiority. They don't look like they're going to establish air superiority anytime soon. And they are getting crushed from the air. That is crazy for what we thought was maybe the third best or fourth best Air Force in the world. The second is the lack of suppression of enemy air defenses or SEED. Shout out to my SEED brethren in the F-16 and EC-130 and rivet joint RC-135 world. SEED is incredibly important. We did it really, really well in Desert Storm. And Russia has an experience or history of doing it really poorly, going all the way back to 2008, where they fought a really weak foe in in Georgia and still lost a lot of airplanes. I anticipated that it would be a lot better. I, I actually, in some analysis I did for the Atlantic Council, said Russia would establish air superiority in 72 hours. So how do I look on that one? Not great. But part of it is because they did not make the finding, fixing, and finishing of SAMs, service air missiles, a priority. And as such, the SA-10 or or S-300 has just been wailing away, and they continue to lose fighters at an unsustainable rate. And they're starting to change their tactics, or they have already changed their tactics. They're not going low anymore because of Stingers and the British uh, Star Streak. And um, so now they're farther off. They're not as precise. They're not getting weapons effects from the air. What does that mean? That's having an effect on the ground because they're not bringing their combat fighters and helicopters to bear the way that they should. And as such, they're losing the ground war. And then the third, and this is an area where Kelly and I talked a lot about because she thinks the character of air superiority is changing. I'm not 100% convinced yet. I think we had a really good conversation. But what I do take away is that the fight for air superiority is not over. It is still an absolutely critical component of any conflict that you go in the future. And it needs to be the critical first thing. It allows the freedom of maneuver for all the rest of our forces. If it's the Pacific, you need air superiority over the Navy, right? Allow them to go wherever they need to. If it's on the ground, you need our ground forces to have freedom of maneuver to execute how they want to. That doesn't happen if you don't have control of the skies. Where Kelly is really focused is that the way that we think of air superiority is probably changing. She talks about air superiority in the blue sky. And what we think about is, you know, going all the way back to Snoopy and the Red Baron with the scarf and, you know, waving in the wind is aircraft fighting each other. 
that is still a major component. I mean, we continue to see that, but now SAMs play a major role. But where Kelly really focuses on is some of those lower altitude threats, things like quadcopters or suicide drones that have been crushing Russian armor. And she points out an area that she and Colonel Max Bremer, uh, Air Force retired, have been calling the Air Littoral. So when we're talking about the seas, the littoral region is off of the coast, you know, X number of miles out where it starts to get into deep water. And that littoral area, kind of an area where the Marines really focus their amphibious operations. Well, she and, and Colonel Bremer think of the Air Littoral kind of the same way, maybe from the sky to 10,000-ish feet where maybe it's not F-15s that are controlling it anymore. Now you got to be worried about quadcopters and suicide drones and things like that and establishing your superiority over maybe a low dollar, low sophisticated force that anybody can bring to bear. It's really interesting. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in F-15 and F-22 units. I can't imagine the threat of the day briefing being on a quadcopter, but it could be because the F-22 pilots of tomorrow may be shooting down a lot more suicide drones and quadcopters than they are Su-35s and Su-57s. Yeah, really good stuff. I get passionate about this, sorry. I <laughs> no, it's great. No, it's great. So one of the things that I had the privilege of doing when I was deployed at 2014 timeframe, so ISIS had just kicked off. My listeners are probably sick of me talking about it, but it was a pretty transformative experience. Uh, I got a plan the first night in Syria. So you've done this before, you've been in the rooms, you've seen how this goes, right? You get everybody playing their role. I was one of the lead ISR planners. And at the time, Syria had, we thought, some sort of defense capability. We did not know what to expect that first night. And so I remember thinking, man, we're sure bringing a whole lot of airplanes to strike these, you know, 20 or 30 targets or whatever. And so that really resonates with me when you talk about that first night, you know, how critical that was, because we were expecting to lose some aircraft. We were expecting to lose airplanes. They had what looked like an integrated air defense system up and ready. And the way it played out is the way it played out, right? We basically operated in Syria uncontested. So yeah, that idea that first night, man, that's really, that's, yeah, that just resonates with me just based on previous experience. As a planner, wouldn't you rather overplan night one, where if they don't turn on their SAMs, because maybe they want to, they just say, okay, we're going to let those cruise missiles go because we don't want to pick a fight. Great. No harm done other than the gas we burn. Wouldn't it be better to do it that way than not bring enough air power to the fight for night one, which the Russians did? And I'm convinced, and I had a great fighter pilot uh, on my podcast, the Brigadier General Zeus Bessler, who has flown F-15, F-16, F-22. And his point was like, they just could totally wasted night one. And as such, that is going to hinder them the rest of the conflict because they were not able to establish or get a long way towards establishing air superiority on night one. And, and here we are eight weeks later, and, and they're no closer virtually than they were that first night. Yeah, no, I, and that's exactly it, right? But we had to know that. We had to plan. We had to think ahead. As you're describing all of these things, I was thinking back about a comment that Dr. Grieco said where we've been kind of the victims of our own success. Mm -hmm. We rolled heavy on night one and kind of nothing bad happened and we almost ran out of our targets. And it's those successes that later kind of bit us, you know, real quick, the Jordanian pilot that went down, we didn't have any rescue assets close enough. Yeah, and for those of you who are not familiar, they, uh, ISIS, who among the worst organization and uh, people in humanity, I mean, they ended up putting him in a cage and, and burning him. It was it was uh, burning him to death. It was an absolutely horrific story. But anyways, that was a formative experience for me as well, that whole thing. And, and uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know how we uh, got on that. Uh, on yeah, that no, just how, you know, we had been so successful for so long owning the air and ground largely that we didn't have rescue assets postured close enough. When that happened, I remember looking over at the recovery cell and we had just all kind of looked at each other. Because there's like, we can't get there. And so still lots to learn there. A lesson I don't think the Russians have learned. Although today there is potentially video. Uh, so we're recording on April 21st, potentially video of a medevac helicopter going to the scene of a downed helicopter and getting shot down. That's the first video I can think of that I've seen actual combat search and rescue or personnel recovery going on on the Russian side. They are getting better, but looks like a good day for the Ukrainians. Yeah, yeah. I also like how you and Dr. Grieco talked about 
what air superiority is. You know, like I said at the beginning of the episode, we were born and grew up with air supremacy, almost uncontested operations anywhere we wanted to. But even in, you know, documents from 2014, 2016, the Air Force's Air Superiority 2030 plan, it talks about how air superiority is going to be temporary in geography and time, that it will be necessary to enable us to conduct certain operations for a limited period of time, and then it will probably change. And even that concept, it seems like it's taken a lot of time for us to turn that corner. And I think it's been fascinating to see it's still necessary. But the nature of it is changing. And I think we're seeing that in this current conflict. The author of that document, now Major General Alex Krinkovich, is one of the bigger air power thinkers we have in the service. And that, I think, was an excellent document. Even if everything has not necessarily turned out to be correct, I thought it was kind of almost a clarion call, if you will, to be super cheesy that, like, the days of air supremacy are over. We are going to be fighting for air superiority, and they are going to be constrained in, in, as you said, time and location. I remember when people read that, they're like, mm, yeah, whatever. That's just trying to buy more six gen fighters. Like, we're always going to have air supremacy. It's almost an anthema to who we are. Mm-hmm. Because, again, we've had so much success. We've been victims of our own success to where we've created a condition where no one in their right mind would line up 60 fighters against our 60 fighters. But now here is where Dr. Greco makes a good point is – Yeah, if somebody wants to go toe-to-toe with us, they're probably not going to bring their Air Force. There's only one Air Force in the world that has a chance to really deny us localized air superiority, and that would be China over the Taiwan Strait. You could maybe make the argument over the South China Sea, but I think there's only one place in the world other than maybe mainland China where we would struggle. But to her point, that doesn't mean we're going to have air superiority because we already saw this with ISIS, and we're seeing it with Ukraine, is you can use low-dollar, low-technology assets that will be able to destroy armor, be able to kill soldiers on the ground that is still all part of air superiority. Even if you get, let's say, the Russian Air Force not to fly their Su-35s, it doesn't mean you've got air superiority if they're continuing to fly some of these very low-technology drones and they're killing people on the ground. So a date that I love to talk about, and Kelly and I kind of debated over it, was April 15th, 1953, which in the air superiority community, we call Air Superiority Day. Since that day, no ground soldier or Marine, no ground force has been killed by enemy air attack, period. That's an incredible statistic. But I don't think that's going to last for very long. And I don't think it's going to be a bomb dropped off of a Su-34 fullback or any of the fighters in China that's going to be the one that kills one of our forces on the ground. I think it's going to be a suicide drone or a quadcopter that drops a little 10 or 12 pound munition and kills one of our forces on the ground. What that means is we need to be thinking about what at least Kelly is calling the air littoral is we cannot just focus solely on countering the J-20 or the Su-57. That's an important skill set, but so is the ability to find, detect, identify, and kill these small things like quadcopters, drones, et cetera. Yeah. And that is such a mind shift. I mean, how many exercises have we been to find the SA-20, right? That's what it is. That's what, I mean, that's been the game ever since we were lieutenants. That's what we do. And sometimes we win. I will (laughs) say, if this war has taught us anything, it is take those things off the battlefield quickly. Russia didn't do that. And the SA-10, a pretty legacy system, is wailing away because Russia didn't do anything about it. So anyways, that, that's just an aside. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and Comac, uh, General Kelly made a great point. Somebody brought up, you know, this getting the wrong lessons out of Russia. And he said something along the lines of, you know, these systems are very good. You could tell by the way the Ukrainians are employing them. So Russian air defenses are excellent when Ukraine uses them. Yeah. So make sure that we take the right lessons, which is that air superiority in the future is by no means guaranteed. It's not a birthright. And we're going to have to fight for it. And we're going to have to take real lessons out of this. We're going to be looking at our friends here, how the Ukrainians fought. We need to almost template that for what a, how a bad guy would fight against us, right? And figure out how would we counter the kind of brilliant strategy that the Ukrainians have had and how they've been able to counter a numerically, a qualitative and quantitatively superior force. Boy, if that doesn't sound like us, we should be looking at what Ukraine is doing and going, good Lord, somebody could do that to us. And then what I hope is the professional in all of us is not on my watch, right? Yeah. And that's actually a super good point to where I was already trying to go. 
I haven't heard a lot of people talk about. You hinted at it when you talked about the professional NCO core that does exist in Ukraine and does not exist in Russia. President Zelensky, shortly after his election, started to rework the ethos of their defense department and capabilities away from the very centralized, top-down, you know, control that is very Soviet era and what we're kind of seeing and into a more professionalized thinking, agile, you know, NCOs with a brain. And I think that's one of the things that I'm taking solace in is the amazing men and women that are in our service, the amazing professionals that we have working for us and finding ways as officers to unleash them because that's how we win. Look at how well we do in conflict at the tactical level. This does not mean we win wars and strategic errors are made and even operational errors are made, but I would put a two-stripe airman against an equivalent enlisted member of any Air Force in the world and think that we're going to do pretty well. And, and I think if you had a soldier, sailor, or Marine here, they would say the same about their two and three stripers. I think they're simply better. And then when we get to the NCO and senior NCO Corps, that's where we really distance our adversaries. But look at what Russia is doing and how they're struggling to adapt on the battlefield. Ridiculously long convoys. And they have no lower level leadership that is like, this is stupid. Maybe we shouldn't be in a 40 mile long convoy. Can you imagine any staff sergeant, any of the services driving in a convoy like that? He'd be like, LT, you're out to lunch. I'm not doing this, right? Respectfully, with all due respect, right? <laughs> exactly. But there is not, and we're extrapolating a lot. You know, I, I'm in my current job, I, I have no access to classified information, which is very strange for an intelligence officer. So everything I'm working off of is what I see in the open source. I know some of the problems that I have, and I am missing some of the data, but at least what I am seeing is telling me that the Russians are not able to adapt on the battlefield and they are not empowering their youngest folks, and they are not very good tactically. What does that tell you? It tells you that the leadership at the tactical level is not there. Their young officers, their NCOs are not leading a conscript force. And if you're going to have a conscript force, you better have some good leaders, and they don't. So they're losing at every level. Bad strategy, terrible operational plan, and terrible tactical execution, which I think has a lot more to do with a lack of mid-level leadership at the officer, and, and they don't really believe in NCOs the way that we do. Yeah. And I think that's a really great way to transition to our ultimate you know, final question, Gorilla, this has been incredibly rewarding, but that's kind of the take home, right? Is that's the responsibility of an officer is to lead other people, to get them the skills and abilities that they need. And I'm going to turn it over to you. This has been amazing. We could go on and on and on. I want to make sure we kind of go out on a high note and leave our audience with what are your thoughts about what is an officer? So first off, been a lot of fun. Do you ever want me to come in and talk? Uh, clearly, I enjoy doing it. So I'll be happy to talk about uh, almost any subject that you can come up with. Uh, I would love to be back on the pod. I've thought a lot about what it means to be an officer. And to me, I, I think it comes down to really two things. And I already alluded to one of them, which would be professionalism. And then the second would be leadership. And you just talked about leadership. So I'll take that one first. And first off, I also want to be clear, leadership is not only the sole domain, excuse me, of officers. There's leadership at our lowest levels. I mean, there's pure leadership among two and three stripers. I just left a squadron of 450 that, I mean, you would see stuff out of at two stripers. It was amazing. But what an officer um, has in terms of the leadership roles, a little bit wider scope of responsibility. And fundamentally, those tough decisions come to the officer's desk. And maybe I'm a little bit uh, influenced by the fact that I just came out of squadron command where the really tough decisions come to us. But I would think that an officer would never shy away from that. We have to make the tough call. And that goes back as long as there's been militaries, right? I mean, as long as somebody has said, go take a hill, there needs to be a leader that says, go take that hill and hopefully runs up that hill with them. So I think leadership is incredibly important. Anybody that is considering a job in the Air Force realize it is not just about tactical execution of cool airplanes and missiles and all this kind of stuff is also about leading airmen. And this is an area where Lieutenant and Captain Wetzel was terrible. And I'd like to think Lieutenant Colonel Wetzel was a lot better. I cared about one thing and that was getting the mission done. And I didn't care enough about the people that I led. What I've started to realize is 
the lasting legacy is not going to be a great brief that I built or, you know, a really good document that I wrote or whatever that was read by a general. It's going to be those people that I helped get promoted. And it's going to be that next generation of leaders. I felt this a lot when I was a weapons school instructor. I was like, man, I, I am going to be building the smartest person in the room. I'm pumped about that. So number one, leadership. I spent a lot of time on that. Number two, I am probably just parroting our professional military education. When I say the profession of arms, because I think every one of our PME courses is something early on a block on the profession of arms, but I take it really seriously. And I think maybe one of the biggest misnomers that people are not familiar with the military would have about people in the military is kind of a a dead end job. You go do that to avoid prison or, or whatever, like any of those bad stereotypes that are out there. I think a lot, especially in our service, I think a lot of the leaders that we have, a lot of the officer leaders are really dedicated to their craft and to being better. And in the last episode, I guess this will be two episodes ago now, you were talking uh, to Spike about the fighter pilot culture. And and I've loved the fighter pilot culture. And one of the things that I've loved about it is the desire to be the best. And boy, it's everything, right? It's the way that they fly. It's the way that they debrief. It's the way that they hit the bars. It's everything is, I'm going to be the best. And I Mm -hmm. loved that about the fighter pilot community because I felt the same thing. We need to try and be better at what we do as leaders and then in the way that we understand the application of air power and other military power. And that's part of the reason why I'm so passionate about analyzing and talking about the Ukraine air war, because I'm with Dr. Greco. I think the character of air superiority is beginning to change. And I don't want to be the dude that is left on the sidelines because I am not able to change with the times. And so as I learn, I want to be able to integrate that new knowledge. I want to be able to teach that to that next generation. And I want, when it's our turn, hopefully not against China or Russia, but if it is our turn and I happen to be a senior leader at the time, I want to make sure that the people that I'm leading in combat are ready to fight whatever that next adversary is and that we dominate, right? That's what America expects out of us is not to win a fair fight. It is to decisively defeat anybody that we come across and they pay us a hell of a lot of money through the budget every year to do that. So we better be good. We have to be really good stewards of the resources the U.S. government and the taxpayer pays us. So it's a long way of saying the fact that we're professionals, read professional magazines or blogs or whatever and get better and strive to be just a little bit better than you are right now. No, that's fantastic. Grill, this has been amazing. Really great privilege to have you on. Hey, if any member of our audience wants to get in touch with you, first off, we're going to put a link to your podcast in the show notes, Air Minded Podcast. If they want to reach out to you, can they find you on social media? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, social media, they can use either the podcast at Air Minded Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Like I say in my pod, I never check LinkedIn. Uh, Probably my least favorite. Or Tyson Wetzel on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. But yeah, so I'm happy in particular on the podcast. If you guys have any ideas for things you want to hear or talk about, hit up at Airminded Pod on Twitter or Facebook. I'll be happy to interact with you. All right. Again, Gorilla, can't thank you enough for coming on. Have a great one. Thanks. Yeah, been my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. Such an awesome interview, like we were saying, so many important lessons learned. Let's start pulling on some of these different threads. There's so many that we can choose from, but really big picture before we start to hone in on some things. There were multiple discussions, both in the previous episode and now this interview here, about learning the right lessons. And that if we look at what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, there will be this tendency, this desire to learn the wrong lesson, which immediately, the most immediate of those is that Russia is not good at what they do. Russian air forces are poorly organized. They don't know how to employ air power. That's the wrong lesson, right? That's the specific wrong lesson, but let's draw further out. Reed, I'm going to ask this question. I don't know that you or I have a good answer to it, but how do we make sure as air force officers that we are learning the right lessons? So my first initial starting point is asking the right question. I think Mm -hmm. we have to ask the right question. And the reason I say that is one of the more classic analytic failures that we discuss in the intelligence community as members who make assessments that have implications for national policy. We study the 2003 invasion and the Iraq war and the search for WMD. Okay. 
the question that people were trying to solve is where are the WMDs? Mm -hmm. Because it was assumed that we had already solved the problem, the real question, which is, are there WMDs? Right. And so once we felt that we had an appropriate answer to that question, we moved on to the next question instead of challenging that original one. And so I think that's kind of where I would start. What questions are we asking? And if we ask the wrong question, I think we'll get, like you said, the opportunity to learn the wrong lesson becomes a lot more likely. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask the wrong question so that we can so we can have a discussion around what is the wrong lesson, and then we can change that into the right one. So here is the wrong question to be asking. How do we win and maintain air superiority in great power competition? That's the wrong question to ask. Yeah. Because that question is going to lead to an answer that was discussed in both in the previous episode and in this interview about pursuing the wrong type of air operation, such as a no-fly zone or dogfight top gun style maverick and goose against Iceman kind of thing in order to determine air superiority. Those are the wrong answers, right? Agreed. Yeah. And I thought that both interviews discussed that really well and brought in these different ideas that challenge the idea of air superiority. And that's, I think the question is, what is air superiority in great power competition? Boom. That's it. That is the right question, is it not? Yeah. And that's something that we explored. And that is not something I think many airmen are ready to just jump in and discuss. And I want to say this too. I don't want people to think that we're going to have these discussions at the expense of still being able to do the traditional air superiority job that we've known, right? We can't give up that skill set. And part of the reason for that, and I think this is something else you wanted to talk about, is that because we got so good, it changed the game. Yeah. So we have to adjust, and we'll talk about you know being victims of our own success, but we can't give up what we've done and do well also at the expense of, well, let's just like go back to the drawing board completely. So it's a balance and it's tricky. Oh yeah, absolutely. And trying to you know, get after the answer to that question, what is air superiority in great power competition? There were some terms that came up that were very new to me. The idea of the air littoral. Now, littoral just on its own was something that was new to me. Shouldn't have been, but I you know, tried to get smart on it. And it turns out that littoral is a boundary between you know, the open ocean or a large body of water and the inland area of land, right? It's the shore plus and minus some distance from that boundary. And as I understand it, right, Reed, that's where the Marines operate. That's why we have Marines, so that we have a capability for moving from maritime and naval operations into land operations, right? Yeah, exactly. The concept being the techniques and procedures and things you do in the open ocean don't apply when there's sand 20 feet below the sea, right? You mm -hmm. can't get your, you know, massive insert large ship here in that zone to conduct its typical operations. Right. And so well, what do you do then? Did you just, I mean, you got to get to the land, right? In order to project power. And so, yes, we literally created an entire service that specializes in that transition zone between the deep sea and the purview of the army, which is normal land operations. Right. Well, now take that concept, turn it vertically. And now we've got this idea of the air littoral, the, the transition zone from the land domain to the air domain. And who's going to have control of that? Who has responsibility for that? What does air superiority in the air littoral region mean? Yeah, agreed. That entire section of the interview with Dr. Grieco was fascinating. And I've interacted with that somewhat. There's an airspace control order. It's issued by the CFAC. It says who gets what airspace to do what with. Mm -hmm. And there's a zone reasonably close to the ground, let's say, you know, 5,000 or 7,000 feet or so. And they just say, that's kind of on your own. 
the Air Force owns everything above that level. Yeah. Everything below that, a free for all. Just don't hit anything, I guess. And this makes sense if you think about how we fly. A fighter aircraft is fast. Yep. And it's hard to do that very close to the ground. There is not a lot of space to maneuver up and down Mm -hmm. when you're going 400 knots plus, right? And so that's why that airspace has not typically been the purview of the United States Air Force. And then that goes right to your question, Colin. Well, then whose is it? Right. Especially now that the average human can engage in that space and have combat effects. I don't know that this was something that happened or could really be discussed even 30 years ago. Right. But now with the invention of better microelectronics, better power, lighter battery sources, quadcopters, et cetera, you can actively have a play in air from a couch with a couple grand. I mean, that's, that's a new thing. Yep. When I was listening to this discussion, I was asking myself, why haven't I heard about the air littoral before? And you said, you know, maybe 30 years ago that it wasn't even something that could even possibly exist, but it has existed now for, you know, at least since the Battle of Mosul, right? You know, that was, you know, 2018, right? And here we are four years later, and I am just now hearing about this concept. I mean, I understand that it's new and we're trying to come to grips with it and we're still trying to figure it out. But what does that say about me? What does that say about the way that we are continually training our officers that such an important aspect of the service that I'm engaged in, I'd never heard of it before? Well, that is a great segue into one of the things that was my big takeaway. Okay. And that is the intersection between equipment and people. So there was a lot of discussion in Gorilla and Dr. Grieco's interview that I felt was hyper focused on equipment. Yeah. Which is really exciting, you know, to hear about. It's sexy. You know, people love fast jets and stuff that goes boom and all that, right? Yeah. Well, and we as airmen associate with our aircraft. Right. I mean, people introduce themselves. Oh, I drive, I'm a strike eagle pilot. I mean, they just introduce themselves as someone who employs equipment X. Yeah. You know, very tied to it. I mean, you see stickers on people's cars in the silhouette shape of their aircraft. I mean, we associate with aircraft and our whole service has been very technology, very equipment focused. General Brown's pointed this out as, hey, we need to get away from that. But I think it's hard. Yeah. And I think that's what the interview showed and what I thought was so fascinating. I even tried to pin Gorilla down a little bit on this aspect you know, and say, hey, let's talk a little bit more about equipment versus, you know, the knowledge, skill, and ability of people. And we did. We talked about it a little bit, but it seems like it just kept coming up. And even, Colin, in our little discussion about the Air Littoral, we started talking about the equipment that makes that now available. Yeah. And how equipment is the limiting factor in engaging in that space with the traditional fourth gen fighters that we've had. And so even in our, you know, attempt to try and be enlightened and focus on training of airmen and getting better as people, we still get caught in this loop of, but how do we do it with what stuff? And I found that aspect of both interviews very interesting. Yeah, because when it really comes down to it, the solution to however we define air superiority and how we're going to operate in the air littoral, the solution is not necessarily going to be found in more or better or faster equipment, but in the way that people operate, you know, how we employ airmen, it's a people solution to an equipment problem. Yeah. Which will have an equipment element <laughs> at the same time. Sure. That, yeah. That's what I mean. Like this intertwining of these two things, it's almost kind of like the contradictions we've talked about in previous episodes. Absolutely. These are balances that you have to hold in your hand. And when you focus too much on one versus the other, things get out of whack. And I still think that we need to focus more on the knowledge, skill, and ability of our airmen to bring that arm of the balance up, because I think we're still too equipment heavy. Uh, It's just a fascinating discussion. 
Yeah. And, you know, we've said multiple times before, say it again here because it still applies, maybe even more so, that all things being equal in a peer to peer fight, the best led military will win. And bringing that now to what we're seeing in Russia and Ukraine, that the better led military can overcome a gap in equipment. I mean, look at how effective the Ukrainian forces are able to be because of how they are trained versus, you know, conscript forces from Russia, right? Yeah, that discussion came up a few times. I especially love their discussion about a professional NCO corps, without a doubt. Yeah. You know, the critical need to be empowering people to make decisions. And I brought that up as President um, Zelensky radically changed the entire perspective of how they brought people into their armed forces and instead of the very top down, thou shalt, it became a very much empower people to make decisions. And we're seeing the impacts of that today. Yeah. And so on that note, I have a disagreement with Gorilla, if I may. I know where you're going. Go ahead. I'll just let you talk and then we'll, we'll discuss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my disagreement with Gorilla is that at the very beginning of the episode that he said that it is not the responsibility of young CGOs or even NCOs to be coming up with ways to beat our near peer rivals, such as Russia and China on the back of a napkin in the heritage room. And to an extent he's right. But if you think about what we were just saying, the empowerment of the professional CGO and NCO core, why can't they, why should we be telling them not to come up with strategic solutions? Yeah. I, and this is a tough one. I think that may have been just a gross oversimplification. And that's fine. And I can accept that. But I think it's still worth talking about. Yeah. And in our pre-gaming before we record, you know, we did talk about it. And I think the point that I am coming down on is a qualified version of that at the expense of current mission or mission accomplishment, I think is what I would qualify that statement with. And because I've actually seen that. I've seen people sacrifice their actual job because they're so worried about solving massive problems that have absolutely nothing to do with what they're here to do. And so, yeah, I hear you. We want that ingenuity. We want that thinking. We want that problem solving applied. And, you know, I know you're going to bring this up, the numbers game, right? There are a whole lot more CGOs than there are generals out there. Yep. So let's leverage that massive brain trust instead of saying, oh, it's not your turn yet and pat them on the head as they go back to, to the grind. So yes, how do we do that appropriately? But yeah, I think that's a fair point. Again, tough question. Probably don't have a right answer, but we don't want to tell people, no, you should not try to make things better. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's one thing that attracts us to this life and these people and this work is that endless pursuit. People always wanted to get better, which I think could lead us to another question. And we kind of touched on it very briefly, but I want to talk about this idea that we have been victims of our own success. Yeah. So why don't you kind of kick off what you wanted to talk about there? And I think we'll tie it in nicely to what we've just been chatting about. They mentioned in both the interview with Dr. Kelly Grieco and now this one with Gorilla that we as an Air Force have been I guess victims of our own success that there's this idea of that because we have been so good at air superiority since 1953, that we don't know how to handle operations where there's going to be a high attrition rate for airmen and aircraft. And similar to what we're asking about, how do we make sure that we learn the right lessons and not the wrong ones? I guess it's similar. It's almost asking the same thing. How do we be really good at what we do, but not become a victim of our own success. Yeah, because like we talked about, it actually changes the nature of the thing such that we can become so focused on it. The only reason we're even having this discussion about the air littoral is because everyone knows they can't stand a chance above that. And so they've had to engage <laughs> at a lower level. Yeah, It's like a never ending cycle of pursuit. And maybe that's why excellence in all we do is part of our core identity, because we recognize that. 
that we're going to change things. We're going to get good at it. And it's going to change the circumstance, the environment that we're in so much that we then have to start again with the cycle to start again. Yep. Sounds like the OODA loop. <laughs> it does. And you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're back to that. So, and that again, ties back into this idea of equipment versus knowledge, skills, and abilities. That's where we have to focus is to get people who can go through the OODA loop better, more quickly, and asking the right questions. That's how we're going to create the force that's going to be able to survive and win in the next conflict. And it also requires that we accept that there will be times when we don't have a perfect solution, that operating in the air littoral, it's a new thing for us as officers for the equipment that we have or will have in the future. We don't necessarily know what the right thing is for that. And that doesn't mean that we should just, you know, turn our heads and pretend it doesn't exist. We need to do the best that we can and accept that there will be some failures along the way. Yeah. That leads me to one of my big takeaways as well is this idea of risk. I think when we get so good at what we do, we actually make risk almost disappear. Right. And I say that very cautiously, right? Absolutely. What we do is still very risky. We lose men and women every year in training accidents, in, you know, just normal operations because the nature of what we do is risky. However, when you're so good for so long, your ability buys down risk. But when we have these big changes, these new and different and unexpected, in order to change, we're going to have to accept some risk. And I think that's one of the take homes from not only the Russia Ukraine scenario, but the changing nature of warfare, the changing nature of air power. We as a service are not very good at this. And that's been highlighted by General Brown and others. And we need to. Not very good specifically at accepting risk. Yes, specifically at accepting risk. And it's going to cost some lives. It's going to cost some hardware. And it's going to be hard. You're going to have to make decisions and accept more risk than you want to. And the reaction is to push that risk higher up the chain when, in fact, we need to be doing the opposite. Yep. We need to be pushing that down. And so everything in you is going to want to be like, well, let's ask the commander. No, 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 no. <laughs> we actually need to be going the other direction with that. And that is a hard place to be. Again, and that's why I come back to those CGOs and those NCOs being part of the strategic solution. Yes, they absolutely need to become tactically proficient, competent, not pursue the strategic at the expense of the strategic. But they do need to play a, a part in the acceptance and the mitigation of risk where possible. Yeah. And Grill and I talked about this. It just, the whole stakes for everyone has been elevated, right? The era where we're really good at everything, no one can fight us, and we just need to drop bombs whenever we find bad guys in the desert. That era is gone. Yeah, And we now need to, everybody has to step up their game. So no yeah. pressure, Colin, you know, no big deal. <laughs> well, I, as I've been watching the Russia-Ukraine stuff play out, as we've been having these conversations, I keep thinking back to the discussion that we had back in December about inflection points. Well, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have fully inflected, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everything is different now. And because it's different, we need to think different. We need to behave different. We need to become different than the way we were in GWAT. GWAT was the time and the place, and we did what we could then. But now is the time to change. Now is the time to accelerate that change, just as that drum has been beat over and over and over again. And if we don't, now we are starting to see why. We might lose if we don't. Yeah. I love Gorilla's discussion about the era post-Vietnam, the Air Force post-Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, that made me pretty hopeful. I came into that yeah. discussion a little down because it is. It's pretty stark to see what could be. But 
the fact that we have been here and done it before gives me some hope. And I really love that he brought that in. It's something I had never considered, but man, there's some really interesting parallels there. Well, I'm glad that you said it because I wanted to, but I was, wasn't really sure if it was appropriate, but I feel very hopeful too, that not that I'm glad that we have entered this era of near peer competition and, you know, cold war 2.0. I don't know. Is that where we are? Maybe, but knowing that we've, we've already done this, it's almost to a T very much the same thing as the post Vietnam military reform era. And so we can go back and see the lessons learned then and start to apply them with minor modifications based on the technology and equipment of our day and see if we can innovate that much faster, if we can get through our OODA loop that much faster than our adversaries. I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. Yeah, we just need to to figure it out and get out of our own way. And I think we do that by empowering the people around us. Absolutely. Super grateful that we had Lieutenant Colonel Tyson Gorilla Wetzel on really enjoyed the interview with him. And if you haven't, please go check out his Air-Minded podcast. Really good. I love his style. I love the way he's digging into the history because I think there are lessons there. And I think that's his whole message, you know? So absolutely head over, check out the Air-Minded podcast. Great stuff going on over there. Really appreciate that he came on. Anything you want to say before we wrap up today, Colin? Nope, that would be it for me. Perfect. That will wrap up this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.